I think there's no silver bullet on generative AI. So the point down here is that platforms can create the toolings, they can create the techniques here, but it all boils down to individual responsible use of AI. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of our podcast. Is generative AI a copyright chaos? Welcome to another episode of Curious About IP. So today I'm joined by Norman O, Regional Operations Lead from the Trust and Safety Global Engagements from Google, and Paul McLean, Head of Legal at IFOS International. So it's interesting how anyone could potentially be an artist these days, huh? Especially with generative AI. Right before this, we were playing around with Gemini, Google's AI tool, and created some pictures. Let's show everyone our beautiful artworks. So Paul, what do you have over there? I have an alien teaching kindergarten. What prompts did you use? Alien teaching kindergarten. <laughs> and Norman, how about you? I have an image of a group of animals in outer space. So the prompt that I used, Cynthia, was generate a photorealistic group of animals in outer space. Mine is baby otters wearing life jackets and a cute hat by a water fountain. Well, we hope you had fun. <laughs> it was fun playing around. You know, I had different animals and different party outfits. So let me ask you, Paul, are we actually the copyright owners of the images that we've just created using Gemini? Probably not. Um, so there was a case in the US uh, recently where someone claimed that because they had uh, used a prompt and they had sort of tweaked that prompt and they claimed to have tweaked it over 600 different iterations. Despite that, the US Copyright Office still said uh, no copyright protection was available. So the answer is no. And the reason is, is quite straightforward. For traditional copyright artworks, for example, the human dictates exactly what happens or at least part of what happens directly. So I get a paintbrush, I put it on a piece of paper and I draw a line. So I'm controlling the expression. Mm. With things like Gemini, there's a person in the middle or, or a non-person in the middle more accurately that you don't control. So you type in authors with hats, you don't decide the output. So you've, you've not really contributed to the expression that's come out. So that's really why you don't get copyright protection. Ah, I see. So me putting orders at a pool party, having fun, I can't own that. No. The yeah, legal guy doesn't say that you cut it. <laughs> legal says no. <laughs> ah, I see. Well, Norman, I know that Google um, has billions of creative works and um, very big on generative AI research and development. That's right. Yeah. So um, actually, how does Google approach the responsible use of copyrighted content when it comes to the AI application? Google was one of the first companies to actually establish AI principles here because without these principles down here, you're actually building on something that, to your point, whether is it responsible or otherwise. And one of the interesting principles that we've established is for AI to be beneficial to society here. And I think that's really, really critical here. So now that we're here talking about IP, as we do that, the idea is to be sure that we embed copyrights and embed respect for IP already in some of these principles. So what exactly does that mean? What that means is that we embed it in a way where we want to respect, you know, all the different countries, cultures, and, and, and locations that we're actually operating in. And I think that's critical. Thank you for sharing that, Norman. So, Paul, how do we actually protect ourselves when it comes to, you know, using AI-generated content? Uh, well, there's a variety of things you can do. Uh, probably the most helpful one for a layperson to understand is that a lot of platforms, including uh, Gemini for certain users, offer something called an indemnity. Mm -hmm. uh, and the indemnity covers, uh, uh, maybe uh, Norman can share more on Gemini specific one, but basically it acts as a shield. So if someone tries to sue you, then the company that offered the indemnity should step in and take responsibility. So I don't know. If in fact, that's right. In fact, I think the idea is, is, is you break it up a bit further. There are two parts on here, right? Mm. You know, as we all know, this generative AI don't exist in a vacuum. You need to actually train the data set. You need to have training data. So the first part of it is that I think we want to indemnify users from third party liability on the training data. So whatever that comes in, that's one part. Against the party claims. On the other part, whatever that we as users, or our communities, our customers that actually use and generated some of these outputs, they also should have the sort of confidence that whatever is generated is also likewise 
protected. But of course, all these don't just exist in a vacuum, right? Indemnity can't just exist in a vacuum here. Mm -hmm. The idea here is that, you know, how then should users discern this, right, Cynthia? Mm -hmm. Aside from using tools, they should be empowered with a sort of context to know whether or not an image or content is generated uh, through AI. Uh, a couple of ways that we can do this. One way, we can talk about watermarking. Mm. Watermarking in imperceptible. Mm. Uh, we could also talk about digital signages, which is also perceptible hashing that I can actually pop up inside there. So the idea here is that they should be empowered with that uh, as they use this sort of content. Mm, very interesting. Uh, but actually, aside from indemnifying users, is there any other issues that users should be aware of when they're using Gen AI content? I think that's really critical. A good question that you asked down here. Users should also look at two sides of the coin. So one side of the coin is that there could be user safety, there could be content safety issues. An example was that May 2023, we actually saw an image where there is an image of a very regal building. There was smoke plumes coming out and there were allegations that there was an explosion at the Pentagon and actually sent the stock prices correcting a little bit uh, during that period. But that was quickly debunked and people found out that this was actually an image there was uh, AI generated, it wasn't real, and it caused some form of misinformation. So mm -hmm. anything, you know, it could be used uh, or generated in that case here could be misinformation. Again, going back to users being empowered with the right tools to make those sort of, of judgments, I think that's really critical. On the other side, Cynthia, I think users should not be afraid to innovate around the use of this sort of tools. Mm -hmm. I personally use it for productivity tools. I use it to generate, uh, for example, a script for myself. I did it around a script because I was doing a summit last week i wanted to ask questions from my panelists here so it actually helped me to 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 to, to ideate a little bit further so i do feel that you know for productivity users responsibly i think it could be a very very powerful tool i think em thoughts? emphasizing on responsibility is the key thing because uh for copyright issues mm -hmm. it's all about risk management really because uh copyright is quite a tricky thing to understand and it's also quite a tricky thing for uh you know someone to really get their head around and use properly. So risk management, you're using it large scale, mm. uh, maybe think a bit more before you release, uh, you know, check, just have a think whether someone else might think, oh, that's copying my style. Even if that's not copyright protected per se, it might get you in trouble. Whereas if you're using something at home with your kids just for fun, then there's very unlikely to be any copyright problems for you, right? I actually use it, you know, Paul, I'm actually going over for a trip to Tokyo at the year end and in fact, I use generative AI tools, in this case, uh, Gemini, mm. and I asked it to suggest a couple of days of itinerary for me and my daughter. I want to take her on a nice trip, uh, just a daddy-daughter bonding trip here, and you know, it helped me to create you know, some form of itinerary. I'm not familiar with Mount Fuji, but it gave me a lot of good suggestions in which then we built and had uh, further discussions on. So I think that online so-called uh, tooling actually helped us to create a, a better bond way before the trip. Oh, that's, that's good. Thank you, Norman and Paul, for sharing how we can use generative AI in our day-to-day -day and increased productivity as well. Um, before I wrap up today's episode, I was wondering if each of you could share one key takeaway for our viewers at home today. Maybe Norman, would you like to start? I think there's no silver bullet on generative AI. Mm -hmm. So the point down here is that platforms can create the toolings, they can create the techniques here, but it all boils down to individual responsible use of AI mm -hmm. and its generative tools. Whether or not that intersects with IP, that's obviously is a concern. But at the end of the day, is that it starts and ends with an individual here. Mm. Uh, but of course, not just on the individual. I think all of us collectively, we have a good chance and opportunity to 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 do a collective effort to get here because it's a whole societal effort that's needed mm. to be able to create, you know, and help engender that level of responsibility. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, but turning it into the the legal world, I would say the the key takeaway, the key message, I would like to put out there is that it's a bit of a misconception to say that AI output cannot infringe. I mean, I think some people have the impression that AI generates synthetic uh, information only and it, it's kind of brand new and it's never existed before. But actually, based on the way that it's trained, the AI can replicate existing photographs, existing text, existing materials mm -hmm. to a limited extent probably, but it, it's probably able to uh, generate something that would otherwise infringe copyright. So I think that would be the a misconception that I'd just like to dispel. I think you raise a very interesting point of what sort of training data that goes inside there. And of course, you know, if you build a training data set, your classifiers, whatever that might be, I should ideally, of course, be 
be, you know, looking at Creative Commons content. And I think that would really bank on that safety, you know, especially when someone is going to use this more frequently as we as we see this coming online more often. But hey, look, there's not just images, right? There's text, you have videos, you know, you have a lot of different prompts that you can actually put up in there. So I think more to be discovered here. Of course, sure. Well, thank you, Norman, and thank you, Paul, for joining us today in this episode. And thank you to you listeners at home. That's the end of this episode. We'll see you next time. Until then, remember to stay curious, stay informed, and stay tuned for more episodes. Bye for now.